would ask the first question, why is it that a philosopher uh, gets uh, interested and involved in a, a reflection and, if, and building a body of thoughts around plants? And what do we or what do you learn from plants? It is the value of learning something from plants that we cannot forget about today. Uh, and uh, to answer your question, I think I would begin from afar. I mean, from Plato's dialogue, uh, Phaedrus. Uh, and so in this dialogue, Phaedrus and Socrates are conversing outside in nature, in the field. They are no longer in the polis, as, they, as Socrates is usually uh, uh, located in. And Phaedrus is wondering why Socrates almost never leaves the city walls. And then Socrates responds to Phaedrus that, and I quote, the country places and the trees won't teach me anything as the people in the city do. I think that, in a sense, this represents the essential problem of philosophy traditionally understood, the problem of exactly who or what we can learn from. As I have been arguing in much of my recent writings, we should ask first what it means to learn from non-human beings and then become apprentices in these non-human knowledges and wisdoms, one of which is what I call in plant thinking the wisdom of plants. Now, the question is in Phaedrus is not only what is philosophy, but also where can and should philosophy be performed? What is the place propitious to philosophy? I'd say that in the Platonic dialogue, the countryside is already labeled a priori before anything happened, uh, an inappropriate setting from, which, from the very beginning, even though much of the conversation takes place there. Right? We should not be taken so far from the polis, uh, Socrates protests. Philosophy should not happen in the countryside. It should not happen, in, it should only happen in city walls and serve the purpose of the city, the common good, which is the highest good philosophy can aspire. But of course, that common good only includes human beings. It does not include the good of animals, plants, and other than human forms of existence. The question then of whether philosophy could happen outside of the city is also the question of whether it could happen for the sake of something or someone outside of our political conception of the good that includes only human beings. Now, in our contemporary situation of the global environmental crisis, there is no higher calling for philosophy than to put itself in the service of a still more universal good than the good of the city. This would be an attempt, perhaps a last ditch attempt, to preserve the planet with all of its living beings. But what is still missing for such an endeavor to take off the ground is another kind of pedagogy, which paraphrasing Paulo Freire's pedagogy of the oppressed, I would call the pedagogy of the extinct or the nearly extinct for that matter. Right? We can discern the negative outlines of this pedagogy from certain classical texts, such as those by Plato. You can see how, beginning to read Phaedrus in a different light, we immediately transition from dismissing the countryside and the trees as a mere natural setting or mere scenery for the dialogue and for thinking. Uh, and we transition from that kind of an idea to uh, uh, really considering the place where philosophy legitimately happens or fails to happen. Where also means for what or for whom, right? Who is listening to me there where I'm philosophizing? And who am I listening to? Socrates is very quick to brush off the suggestion that we can learn from non-human beings here, plants or trees, but I want to keep returning to this suggestion over and over again. So philosophy is literally the love of wisdom, philia and sophia. If you define wisdom not only in anthropocentric, human-related terms, but much more broadly, including, for instance, the wisdom of plants, then the love of wisdom would be the love of other than human modes of knowing as well. Right? At issue, then, are not only certain physical boundaries, the places where philosophy is circulating or can circulate legitimately, but also the boundaries of philosophy itself and of the object of its love or affection. Remember that all Socratic dialogues are erotic in a sense. Socrates is in, in the hot pursuit of his love object. In this case, it is both knowledge embodied in the books and uh, also Phaedrus himself, whom Socrates is pursuing in the dialogue. Socrates is being seduced by Phaedrus, but is uh, also saying that he is unable to be seduced by the countryside and the plants. 
this is where I want us to go with this apprenticeship uh, in non-human knowledges and wisdoms that I'm proposing. Just I would like to ask to, to add immediately the question is that this divine between the city which is the human built environment and therefore the thinking built environment uh, whereas the countryside is uh, could be related somehow to the wild and to something which is not worked upon or which is raw in a way, I would say. What would be your take today with this thing that more and more people are living in cities and then we can see a whole adaptation to various kinds of plants to, their, to, to our built environments? Of course, uh, there are important distinctions to be drawn, but uh, in this era, which is called the Anthropocene, of course, even the distinctions between the uh, direct human intervention in the environment and, uh, uh, and, and the non-intervention, these distinctions fade away and uh, collapse. Uh, because even if it seems that humanity has not intervened in uh, some sort of, a, let's say, uh, a stretch of a virgin forest, a forest that has not been planted on purpose, but that has uh, grown by itself, even if there has not been such an intervention, the modification of, of the climate, uh, the uh, ubiquity of microplastics and all kinds of other traces of collective human industrial activities are influencing actively and shaping these environments in which uh, human hands and thought have, have not in intervened directly. So I would first want to problematize that kind of a divide that I think is uh, less and less uh, prevalent today. And secondly, I think that uh, uh, obviously I see a lot of um, mobilization around practices of the so-called rewilding, uh, when, when people are uh, valorizing plants that sprout by themselves in, in the cities in very small, usually spots of, of land or soil, even between rocks or between the cracks of the pavement, for instance. And there is a, a growing valorization of that kind of uh, return, the uninvited return, let's say, of, uh, of nature and particularly vegetal nature, uh, even in the most urban and urbanized environments. Uh, uh, so I, I think that much of what is happening today uh, with regard to plants, but also with regard, for instance, to the current global coronavirus situation can uh, be thought under this heading of the return of the repressed, the return, the, the return of the repressed vegetal nature, the return of the repressed uh, uh, relation to wilderness or, or the wild uh, that ultimately produces these uh, uh, eruptions, unexpected eruptions of uh, the coronavirus or of, uh, of plants that all of, of, all of a sudden sprout in the cracks in the pavement.